Celestial Sphere Review Part 1, Celestial Coordinate System. Just to first refresh your memory or get you familiar with the Celestial Sphere, I'm going to point out some of the components of the Celestial Sphere that you will need to know for the exam on Thursday. To begin with, just like on the Earth, we have a Celestial Equator, which in the case of this Celestial Sphere is the plastic seam that is connecting the two hemispheres together. Um, that is directly in the same plane as the Earth's equator. So if you could extend the Earth's equator outwards in all directions, it would intersect with the celestial equator. We ha also have a celestial north pole, which is directly above our north pole, or in line basically with the star Polaris. And we have the celestial south pole, which would be directly over the south pole. Some other just basic components of this would be we have this silver horizontal bar represents the horizon, and the silver vertical bar represents the meridian, which when the sun is located on the meridian, that marks solar noon, uh, also the location where the sun will have its highest um, altitude above the horizon. If we look more closely at the celestial sphere, we will be able to see the lines of right ascension and declination. From this view, hopefully we can see a couple of different things. So here again is our celestial equator. We measure declination, uh, which is the distance in degrees above or below the celestial equator from starting at the celestial equator. So the celestial equator has a declination of zero degrees and each line as we go down the celestial sphere will have a declination or will have increased by 15, so this would be negative 15, negative 30, etc. Going up, it would be positive 15, positive 30, etc. as we go. We also measure right ascension, which is measured going east of the spring equinox. And so right here, um, this is the spring equinox. That would have a right ascension of zero. And as we move to the east, this would be one hour, two hours, three hours. And you can always find those numbers located just above the celestial equator. So there's our one, there's our two, etc. Another thing that we can see on the celestial sphere, the way it's positioned right now, you should be able to see this dashed line, <coughs> pardon me, with some dates on it, and that is the ecliptic. And the ecliptic is tilted at 23 and a half degrees relative to the celestial equator, and that's due to the 23 and a half degree tilt of the Earth. And so on the summer solstice, when we are in, Jan or in June 21st, we will be, it has its highest declination and will be located as high as 23 and a half degrees above the celestial equator. Then as we move on to the autumnal equinox, we'll see that the ecliptic crosses the celestial equator on its way south. So on the equinox on September, in September 21st, we will have our autumnal equinox and the declination of the sun is zero. When we move to December 21st, we have our winter solstice and the sun has its lowest declination of negative 23.5. And then as we move back to March, we will end up with our vernal or spring equinox at which the sun will have a declination of zero again. So just as a reminder, the declination or the range of declination is due to the fact that the earth is tilted. And if the earth were not tilted, the declination of the sun would always be zero. When using right ascension and declination to locate different objects, I suggest starting with the right ascension and finding that your certain hours of right ascension along the celestial equator. So if we're looking for a star that has a right ascension of five hours and 15 minutes and a declination of positive 46 degrees, I would start out by looking along the celestial equator to find the correct hours. So as I'm looking along here, this is two hours, here is three hours, here's four hours, and so five hours and 15 minutes is what I had said. Now, each hour of right ascension, because this is based on the rotation of the Earth, 
for each hour of right ascension that goes by, one hour on earth goes by. Each of those hours is broken into 60 minutes, which then is broken into 60 seconds. We don't have to worry about that on the scale um, of the celestial globe, but we do look at the minutes. And if our declination was five hours and 15 minutes, we would break this five hours and 15 minutes is kind of like saying five and one quarter hours. So we're going to go about a fourth of the way across this line between five and six and start here. From there, we're going to start counting lines of declination upwards. And so this is going to be 15 degrees. This one would be 30 degrees. This would be 45 degrees. And just a little bit above that would be 46. And so at that location, if we pivot this this way, we are going to find the star of Capella. And Capella would be the star we're looking for. Notice it's just above the positive 45 line of declination. Now that we've talked about the different parts of the celestial globe, as well as the celestial coordinate system, including right ascension and declination, we're going to talk about how to set the celestial globe up to model the sky and model different events at different locations. The way I prefer to set this up um, is to simply use the lines of right ascension and declination on the sphere to locate uh, the things that I am discussing as opposed to using the measurements on the metal bars on the meridian, etc. as sometimes that um, acts to confuse students. So if we were going to set the celestial sphere up for a location of 60 degrees, we've talked about how the altitude of the North Celestial Pole always matches the latitude um, from of your location. So if I were to set the celestial sphere up for a location of 60 degrees, beginning at the North Celestial Pole, I will count down 60 degrees using the declination circle. So this would be 15, this would be 30, this would be 45, and this would be 60. And then I will position the celestial sphere. I will rotate it so that that line is directly on the horizon, um, on the northern horizon. So when I recheck, my north celestial pole is 15, 30, 45, 60 degrees above the horizon. That means I'm modeling a latitude of 60 degrees. If I want to model a latitude of 30 degrees, I would simply count down 15, 30, and I will rotate the celestial globe so that that line of right ascension is just above the horizon. And if I double check, here's 15, here's 30 degrees. I'm modeling a location of 30 degrees. Now that we have the location set on our celestial sphere, and I currently have this set up for 30 degrees north latitude, we can determine to set it up for a specific date. And the way we do that is by dialing the sun using this knob up near the northern celestial pole, and we dial that to the specific date along the ecliptic that we would like to model. Currently, it is February 20th, and so if I want to model February 20th, I will simply dial this sun until it is aligned with February 20th. And we'll see if we can zoom this in so you can see that. So there's my February 20th right there. I've got my sun aligned, and so now I'm modeling the celestial sphere for September 20th. And this allows me to do things such as to count daylight hours. To count daylight hours, what I do is I'm going to place the sun at solar noon. So I'm going to place the sun directly on the north meridian, or the meridian that's running right overhead. I'm going to mark one of the lines of right ascension with my finger. Currently, there's one right under this meridian. And I'm going to count how many hours pass. One two, three, four, five, and now I'm getting close to the horizon. I need to check and get down here. And I'm gonna continue on until I see the sun go just below the horizon. And so I have about five and a half hours went by and my sun has set. It's a little hard to see because of the angle of the camera, you wanna make sure you get down to eye level. And what that would mean that on this date at that location, because I counted half of the sky, we need to double it. So five and a half times two would mean that at this location, we would have about 11 hours of daylight.
One other concept that I would like to cover with this is how we can tell time at which things would be happening, where we can figure out a time of sunrise, we could figure out a time of sunset, we can look at how many hours an object is in the sky, etc. And so as we're doing this, a couple things to keep in mind. If this is solar noon, where the sun is directly over the meridian, the sun rises in the east, so that means that if we place the sun right over here at the meridian, that would be sunrise. It cuts across our sky and it would set in the west, and so that would be sunset. To tell time, we can either place the sun at solar noon and count hours of right ascension. So if this is 12 noon, then this would be 1 p.m., 2 p.m., 3 p.m., 4 p.m., etc. The other place that we can look is we can dial the sun around to the back on the backside meridian there, and that would be midnight. And if we look at that as midnight, then we can also we can count backwards from there. And so this could be um, 11 p.m., 10 p.m., 9 p.m., 8 p.m., or we can go the other way, starting it there, and we can count, you know, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m., 5 a.m., etc. So as long as you count, you start at either noon or midnight, you can count hours of right ascension from those locations to calculate time. In order to tell if an object, such as these pink planets, which are placed on here, would be visible and for how long, uh, remember, in order for an object to be visible, it needs to be above the horizon while the sun is below the horizon. So you could start counting from midnight with the sun on the back, count what time they rise at, and count what time the sun rises at, and that would give you their duration of visibility. So just a review from that the other day. Another concept that I would like to cover with this is the fact that we can use this to plan viewings at night, etc. And so in one of the activities, we were supposed to see what constellations would be visible in the night sky if we went out at sunset and viewed until midnight. And so in order to do that, you would set it for the desired date and the desired location. And for that activity, I believe, we set it for 45 degrees, so I set our location and our date. So again, just as a little review, I would count from here, I would go 15, 30, and I have to bring this up until that 45 is right on the horizon. I would then set the time to sunset, which would be placing it on this horizon over here, and again, get down to eye level and look and see from the camera's viewpoint, it looks like, you know, it's, you can still kind of see it, but it is technically below the horizon, so this would be after sunset. And if you have it look like, looking like that, anything you see that's above the horizon right now, those would be stars or their constellations that would be visible in the night sky. Again, that's ignoring light pollution and ignoring any obstructions at the horizon, um, but that gives us a general idea. When I asked you to then say, well, then what constellations you know, would you see between sunset and midnight after you've looked this over? If you dial the sun to midnight, what you'll find is that the constellations that were over here have moved to this side. New constellations have come up here, so you need to kind of scan this side to see what new constellations have shown up in the night sky. The other concept that was also covered there was the idea of circumpolar constellations. And those are the constellations here that as we rotate the celestial sphere, they never set, they never go below the horizon. And so you'll see anything right here does not go below the horizon, so they are not seasonal, they show up any time uh, of the year it's possible to see them. As far as the concept of seasonal constellations go, because the sun, because we orbit the sun and it appears to move through the constellations, such as the constellations of the zodiac, the sun will be in different parts of the sky throughout the year, which means different constellations will be up during the daytime, and that is the reason we have seasonal constellations. That's the reason that I encourage you to get out and look at Orion now, because it's a winter constellation, and by the time we get to our spring viewings, if you look at your spring viewing chart that I gave you, you'll see that Orion is no longer visible. Hopefully this helps out. Please feel free to review uh, the different parts of this video to help you get ready for the upcoming exam.